<clears throat> Thanks very much. It's a real pleasure to be here. <clears throat> we used to say in the uh, State Department that if you didn't know the person walking down the hall toward you, you could say, oh, good to see you, Mr. Ambassador. And that would always work, because very often the person was an ambassador. Or if he wasn't, he wanted to be an ambassador. He thought he should be an ambassador. So it's like coming here and saying, hi, professor. Good to see you. Uh, and it's, it is kind of you to uh, invite a, uh, a non-professor. I'm an adjunct at Georgetown. We know adjuncts don't really count. So um, <clears throat> I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I have taken a look at the panels and wish I could really have been here all day because so many of them are so interesting and so representative of this organization's commitment to scholarship and to applying scholarship to the uh, study of the Middle East and Africa. Uh, there is an alternative, which is, of course, um, the tendentious products of ideology and partisan politics. But you leave that to another organization. Uh, how are we doing? OK, that's better. <clears throat> I do want to talk about the Arab world now, after the Arab Spring. Um, and the problem is a simple one to state. Everyone's in favor of democracy and human rights. We are in favor of democracy and human rights at all times, everywhere. But the Arab Spring failed, except in Tunisia so far. So there is an argument that is made that um, we should give up on it. Uh, common sense suggests giving up on it, um, especially in view of the, uh, the so-called security dilemma. That is, um, if you open up the political system in a number of Arab states, uh, what you're going to get in a, in a real election is an Islamist victory. And particularly right now, with the dangers of uh, terrorism in the Middle East, of violent Islamist groups, it's too dangerous. It's too dangerous for the countries in question, and it's too dangerous for the United States. Uh, so goes the argument. Um, there is, of course, a more general argument that I actually do hear, though it is voiced very quietly, which is, come on, Muslim states, Arab states, can't do democracy. Be realistic. You know that. But I think all these arguments are wrong. And that's what I really want to talk about today. What, why should one be more optimistic? One thing about the Arab Spring, which you know as uh, academics, it was not predicted. What happened? What explains the failure? And now, of course, the academic literature is trending away from authoritarian resilience and toward the question of why the Arab Spring and why did the Arab Spring fail? Um, first, I, there is the argument that it's Islam. Now, I don't take that argument very seriously because I think one can see in Asia, in Africa, a number of examples of uh, Muslim democracies. So it isn't uh, Islam. Is it that Arabs don't want democracy? Well, uh, you know, there's a lot of survey data on this question now, going back to the Arab Spring and before it, that shows that even now, um, very, very high percentages of the public in Arab countries say they do want democracy. Now, one can then ask, well, what do they mean by democracy? Do they mean what we mean in the, in the US or Canada or Western Europe? Well, um, again, I think it's too easy to say, no, they're, they're thinking about something entirely foreign. Um, they are thinking about <clears throat> justice. They're thinking about independent courts. They're thinking about representative government chosen in free election. It isn't so distant from the, let's say, American definition. It is true, I think, that at least in two ways, Arab democracies are going to differ for a very, very long time from what we see in the United States or Western Europe. The first is there will be no neutrality among religions. 
Islam will have a special position that other religions are not going to have. There may be tolerance of other religions, but there is no question, I think, that there will not be equality of all religions. And second, the question of gender, where there has been progress in some uh, Arab countries. Tunisia is an example. Um, but um, it will be a very long time until the kind of equality that we see in Western Europe or, the, or North America uh, comes to the Arab world. Moreover, um, I think we can say a few other things about the difficulty of achieving democracy. It's clear that homogeneity, homogeneity helps. Homogeneity helps. It is not a coincidence that Tunisia is the great success story. It's one of the most homogeneous Arab countries. Compare, for example, uh, the role of tribes in uh, Libya or uh, Iraq, Syria, um, or the Sunni Shia Kurdish splits. You see nothing like that in Tunisia. And those splits <clears throat> matter. I remember the, there was a professor at Stanford who uh, criticized President Bush during the Iraq War. President Bush had given a speech in which he said, don't you think Iraqis want to be free? And I remember the comment that was made. The answer to that question is yes. When you ask an Iraqi, do you want to be free, he or she is going to say yes. But that's the wrong question. The question is, do you want your neighbor to be free? And if the answer is, my neighbor, my neighbor is a damn Shia. My neighbor is a Kurd. Well, you have a huge uh, barrier to building a, a democracy. Um, it's obviously also easier to build a democracy if, in effect, you're rebuilding a democracy. That is, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, much easier when you're dealing with countries that had an experience with democracy prior to the Second World War, prior to the Soviet takeover. Um, and it is easier if there is a real uh, model and magnet. And we know that for the, in the post-Soviet space, the model and magnet was the EU. Everybody wanted to join the EU, and in some cases, NATO. And there were political requirements, which people then uh, strove to meet. So it seems to me that um, what all of those barriers prove is not that it is impossible ever to achieve democracy in the Arab Middle East, but rather that it's going to be difficult and it is going to take a very long time. Now I should turn here to the, the question of um, the Islamists because I think, as I said at the beginning, why are so many in the West afraid of democracy in the Middle East? And the answer to that is afraid of Islamist takeovers, afraid that what happened in Egypt will be replicated in many other countries. Um, this is this security dilemma is the real reason Western democracies ally with dictators. I mean, this explains what we did in the Cold War. And even before the Cold War, you know the famous comment by Franklin D. Roosevelt when um, someone said to him that the dictator Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua was a real son of a bitch. And Roosevelt replied, yes, but he's our son of a bitch. Uh, and there is that feeling in the in the Cold War, obviously, the question was, which side are you on, the Soviet side or the American side? Now it is terrorism. Now it is Islamist extremism and violence. You cannot risk an election. That's the argument. You cannot risk widening the political aperture. But. I think experience suggests that Islamists don't win in great landslides and don't retain their popularity. I mean, if you look at Egypt, for example, when Morsi won his election, which was a pretty fair election, he squeaked through. He won 51-49 against what was in many ways the worst possible candidate you could have put up against him, a felul, a relic, a minister from the Mubarak period, General Shafiq. Um, it's pretty standard, actually, that what happens happened in Egypt happens. That is to say, if Islamists win, they lose popularity very quickly. Uh, we've seen it all over Asia. 
We've seen it in Tunisia. We've seen it in Egypt. Why did the Islamists win the first election? Well, first, I would say, in many cases, they have not been suppressed by the dictators. It is the center that has been suppressed. Egypt's an example of the 2005 elections for parliament. The Muslim Brotherhood got 88 seats. They probably would have won more in a free election, but they got 88 seats. So where were the Brotherhood leaders, actually, when Tahrir Square happened? Home, at work, in Cairo. Mubarak used them as a foil against the United States. It's me or the Brotherhood. While pretty effectively suppressing, what should we call them? Centrists, moderates, Democrats, liberals, seculars. That's who he really worried about and whose appeal he really worried about. Um, and you see this, I would say, today under General Sisi. Um, so what happens? When the regime falls, the moderates are nowhere. But the Islamists are well organized. They have organized underground. They have organized in the mosques. They're good at it. They're good at secret conspiracies. The moderate liberal secular types aren't. They are nowhere the day that the political aperture comes, the political opening comes. And the Islamists can win. They have other advantages. They have a reputation for integrity. Of course they have a reputation for integrity. They've had no power. So no one's ever offered them a bribe. What happens, of course, when they get power and the temptation. Um, but when they're out of power, they get a kind of halo. They're holy. They're not corrupt. They spend their time opening clinics for poor children. The, I think we have seen, and there's good academic literature about that, the number of people that are reached by such social activities on the part of the Islamists is actually quite small. But they have the reputation for being uh, incorruptible and magnanimous. Um, and then they win. And it turns out that um, they don't know how to govern. They do not have any answers. When it comes to economic policy, for example, creating jobs, Islam is not the answer. They have no answers. And they begin to lose power very quickly. But at least they begin to lose support. And we saw this, we saw this with the Anata Party in Tunisia, which did very well, it didn't get a majority, but very well in the first election and began to lose support. And obviously, after a year in power, Morsi had a, alienated just about every Egyptian who was not actually a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. So the first thing I'd say about the risks of opening the political space is that the Islamists are going to do pretty well in the, the first election, and then they're going to start falling off. And we need not fear that they are a permanent majority in the Arab Middle East. But I'd make a second argument. Of course, we oppose them and their arguments. In fact, we oppose those arguments even if they are promoted nonviolently. We don't agree with their vision of what the country, the state, should look like. I would make the argument that the generals, the dictators, are actually poor at defeating Islamists. Far from being reliable allies in this fight. I say that because Islamist extremism may or may not be violent. But it is, in both cases, an argument. It is a view of life. It is a view of society, of the way to organize society. Policemen cannot win that debate. They do not have an alternative vision to offer. Politicians are the people who have to offer that alternative vision. Say, vote for me. Do not vote for that party. So, I would say you see it in Egypt today, but I think you see it in many other countries as well. Mere, if I can put it this way, mere repression is not enough. It does not win the debate. 
it does not win the loyalty of the population, of the voters, to alternative theories of how the society and the state should be organized. Uh, I don't want to take up all this time speaking rather than having Q&A, so let me conclude with just a few thoughts. What are the implications of what I'm saying? Suppose I'm right. First, American support for democracy and human rights in the Middle East should focus more on politics. We have a tendency to focus on NGOs and civil society. The problem with NGOs and civil society is that they don't know how to govern. They're not even trying to govern. Yes, in cases where the political system is entirely closed, there are no political parties. There is no political debate. OK, then you do the best you can. And the best you can is probably NGOs and civil society organizations. But even there, choose among them the ones most likely to be able to make the transition to politics when it is possible. Uh, I'll just take a minute for a Nelson Mandela story. Under the military dictatorship that was existing in Nigeria when Mandela was first president of South Africa, a group of NGOs came to him and said to him, President Mandela now, um, we want your support for an oil embargo against Nigeria. And of course, they assumed they'd get it. And he said, no. He refused. And he said to them, look, my organization, the ANC, was not an NGO. We were a political movement whose purpose was to win power and govern. You guys are nowhere. You can't win power and govern. You weren't even thinking about winning power and governing. And if the government in Nigeria fell tomorrow, you would not be ready. We were ready. So I think we need to have much more concentration on the political sector rather than the NGO civil society sector. Secondly, I'd say I'd like to see us um, give more democracy and human rights aid to organizations uh, that are not in the business of making money, so-called Beltway Bandits. I say that not because I'm opposed to making money, but because they're too tame. They make their money by being able to go to these countries and do programs. If they get involved in something that seems to be a challenge to the government, they're going to be excluded. So they will never undertake programs that do what we want to do, which is to begin to develop a political debate in the country. Thirdly, I'd say we need to protect Arab Democrats. They exist. From the American point of view, there are too few of them. But they exist. And they are sometimes jailed, harassed, beaten. We can help them. We can help them politically by trying to protect them in our conversations with Arab governments. We can help them individually, for example, by uh, providing money, by saying to someone who's just come out of prison, let us pay for you to do a semester at an American college. Catch your breath. Reflect on your experiences without having to worry about being rested again tomorrow morning. Take your family with you. These are lifelines that we can and should be giving. Work hard. Uh, work hard to ensure against backsliding. It's hard enough to achieve democratic advances. Once they're achieved, it should be a major goal of the United States to salvage them and prevent backsliding. Um, I think there are uh, two security dilemmas. The first security dilemma, the more familiar one, is if there is an opening in the politics of Arab countries, will extremists be able to take over those governments? But the second dilemma is how do we, in the United States and other democracies, react to a vicious crackdown that is uh, ostensibly aimed at the extremists, but is really really much more aimed at simply keeping the government in power, in power and in place, and suppressing any form of opposition to that government. Um, I would argue that defeating the um, Islamists is going to require more than repression. It is also going to require legitimate governments that have the support of 
their people, their voters, and can win and maintain that support by making arguments that make sense to the population about the nature of the society and the state and its future. With that, um, let me stop and uh, say there are, of course, a million things in the Middle East that I have not talked about. Um, but I encourage you to ask about them. I'm not, I'm not um, saying I know all the answers to the questions you're going to ask. But um, whatever is of interest, please um, try it. Thank you.